so just to check. So, so let me just start by saying that the European Climate Foundation, I guess, is a mystery to you. And it's, uh, in principle, a, a, a fund based on philanthropic money. Uh, trying to work as a, a, an enabler for the decarbonization of uh, Europe. So it's a very wide thing, thing that we have been taking on. And what we are doing is that we work with different uh, parts of society. I'm responsible for power, <clears throat> and we have been working a lot with the power industry, uh, the TSOs, the power companies, the NGOs and, and try to build up some sort of common understanding of what needs to happen. I will try to, in 15 minutes, give a very broad overview of my general experiences. And I just wanted to start by showing this, that renewables is about going from imagination to reality. I worked for many years at Vattenfall. I started a, a Swedish uh, utility. I started there in the end of it. 80s. Then we were, Vattenfall was running a minor research program on wind, had some wind turbines on an island somewhere. When I left Vattenfall 20 years later on, uh, renewables was a major part of the operations, of the investments. Uh, the company invested billions a year, investing in UK, in Germany, in Sweden, in Denmark offered solar energy to the customers. So I would say that part of this have already happened. We have already seen this building up and, and renewables and, and a more sustainable power system is on its way. But of course it takes time. So, uh, and my second starting point is this. What is this all about? Yeah, it's not about that we are running out of, of energy. We discussed uh, shale gas earlier on. This is a, a very interesting overview I found uh, in a report from the World Energy Council, 2004. It's, if you look into the situation today, you would say that this, this part is even bigger with shale gas. But I, what I wanted to say that it's, it's not as such, it's a result research or a resource problem. It's about what is uh, acceptable in society. That is what is driving this uh, development. There are enormous, and I think there are two things you should remember. There are enormous amounts of, of renewables. In principle, we can view them as unlimited from a global perspective. And the other thing is that we will not as such run out of fossils. fossils. They will be outcompeted, and that is on its way. So let me then go into the sort of work we have been doing. In 2010, uh, ECF published a study called The Roadmap 2050, built on a, a major work done together with many, many partners. We analyzed the situation, what, can, what needs to happen in the time perspective 2050 in Europe and what can happen. And uh, I will just go through some highlights. First of all, we could really prove that 80 per, an 80% reduction on the European level is feasible, but it's challenging, of course and that it will take a 95% decarbonization for the power system. So in principle, the uh, power system needs to be de decarbonized. We also, as a part of this effort, we're running a, a power system model for Europe and could demonstrate that it's, it's possible to do this in different ways. We worked with different generic combinations of renewables from 40 renewables to 60 and 80. We even looked into a 100% case. And you can see that there, all three pathways are fully possible. If you want to, have to decarbonize uh, or have 100% renewables, you will need to use more geothermal resources and you will need to use some to interconnect to, to Northern Africa. 
You can also see that there are no major cost differences, but what, it, what will have to change is that the, the capital investments will be up enormously. So the, the cost mix will change totally. And in principle, uh, a system with 80% or more renewables will be, in principle, a capacity cost. The cost to run the system will be very low. It, I would say today, if you take the European average, it's a 50%. 50% mixture between CapEx and OPEX. The decarbonized system will perhaps be 90, 10, or something like that. On the margin, you will always have some sort of thermal capacity. And uh, then uh, there are, of course, with more renewables uh, implications. Uh, intermittency, uh, to avoid uh, curtailment and so on will be more demanding, but it's fully possible, I will come back to that a little bit later, that you need to invest in transmission capacity. And the transmission capacity is a minor part of the total cost. <coughs> and uh, the macroeconomic effect is minor, I would say. It's not so, and I will come back to that also, that you can see that this will destroy the European economy in any way, if you do it in the right way. So it's to a very big part about how it's implemented. It's not about if it's implemented. So the, the direction is clear, but the demanding thing is to handle the, tra the transition. So uh, this is one way of showing the outcome of the different alternatives, you have the 20, 50, 40, 60, 80 percent renewables. The rest is, is CCS and uh, nuclear. So it's, it's 30, 30, 20, 20, 10, 10 here. And you see that you can, in principle, fill out all this with, with wind and solar. But the, if you look into this situation, you have still a, a, a thermal system dominating. So you see that the, how the different uh, contributions, the variations in the different contributions would change enormously. We should at the same time be aware that we are discussing 40 years, the situation 40 years ahead. So there are a lot of innovation and so will come in. So, so I'm, I'm quite convinced myself that we will see more advanced storage, for example, coming in, because that will create value in this system. But it's nothing that is available today, if you try to stay real. And uh, this is, in principle, what you see if you're trying to look into what sort of costs you have. So the baseline, that is a conservative uh, business as usual combination. Uh, is the variations are bigger in that than in, in the decarbonized pathways, if you take them all. So, so that is a little bit to show that there is not a fundamental change in cost. The, the problem is that costs will be up anyway. And that will, is a hard sell to the general public. So based on that then, this was a very short version of a study that took us a year and a lot of resources. Uh, we started to look into where do we need to be 2030? Because 2050 is so far away, so it's hard to see the implications. What are we going to do? What will be the next steps? So, so 2011 with the same group of, of different um, participants, we looked into 2030 based on, on uh, decarbonization level in the economy in general, on the level 40%. That will mean 60% for the power sector. And on the average, around 50% renewables. So that means that renewables will be the dominating um, power source. And I won't go into details here, I just wanted to see the, to show you what we did here was to run a power system model. Um, it's, this is not real grids, it's capacity between uh, centers of gravity. We used 45 centers of gravity all over Europe. 
ran a power system model hour by hour, looked into what do you what sort of resources do you have need to have to balance the system, and you see that it's it's you need transmission capacity needs to be up enormously, and especially this is interesting for you. I think <laughs> you see you will need enormous capacity. There are some places here, of course. As I say, this is not the grid, it's the capacity you need. You need. In reality, you will <coughs> implement this with a different, um, <coughs> based on different sort of investment, subsea cables and so forth, and as such will come in. But, but the interesting result is that you look into the overall, overall cost. You see that the, trans, the capex cost for transmission and backup is a minor. And uh, the cost for running the backup is also minor. So, so, so the cost to achieve this is less than 10% of the total cost. We have 16 different scenarios. I will just show you one slide. But, but you see that, that uh, investments in the system that is backup and transmission creates an enormous value. It's a minor part of the total effort but it's quite hard to achieve due to different reasons. We can come back to that in, in uh, the discussion. So after we have published our studies, uh, the European Commission came out with their um, energy roadmap 2050, done in a very different way, with a very different model, a macro combination of an uh, engineering model and uh, macroeconomic model, but in principle confirming the same results. What you see is first of all that the role of electricity in the total energy system will have to grow substantially if you are going for a, a decarbonized, more sustainable system. It will be up for, from around 20 today, of the defined as final energy demand, to up to 40. That confirms the results that we got out of our study. The Commission worked with five different scenarios with different combinations. Uh, a major effort in energy efficiency, uh, a diversified combination, high res, delayed CCS, low nuclear. <clears throat> but the interesting result is that you see that the share of renewables in the time perspective up to 2030 will, in principle, be the same. Then you will see it will grow in a little bit different directions. So whatever, this, this is renewables in general, it's not in power. The, the renewables share in power will be much bigger. It will be, I would say, around 50, 50%. So this contains also biofuels or transport is the, the other big issue. In the first study we, we made, we assumed that you electrify transportation to a, a big extent. And uh, you see what will happen to costs. They will be in principle. Yeah, they ha you have what is called the current policy initiative uh, and then the, the diff five different scenarios. You see, there are no major differences in costs before around 2030, 2035. Then you, they say that if you go for even more rest, it will be more expensive. I will say that you, this is doubtful because it's much more uncertain. There will be a lot of innovation. But, but it, 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 as I said before, it indicates clearly that there are no major, it's not a cost issue as such. And what will happen is that you, you will see if you invest in renewables, and we have partly already seen that, is that uh, a lot of innovation will come out of that. And that will go in three different stages, I will say. That uh, productivity will be up, uh, falling prices, we have already seen that with solar power to the extreme, uh, will, will, uh, will lead to, to, to uh, more investments, and uh, expand the economy, and the productivity will continue to increase. And that will, will cause uh, significant uh, improvements in, in, in productivity in all sectors. So it's a part of a, a setting, starting a positive development, leading to a more 
sustainable but also more competitive economy. We have recently asked uh, PwC to look into, if you take three examples, Denmark, Germany and Sweden, that have decarbonized enormously. And uh, can you say that they are less competitive? This is unpublished material. But what is really interesting is that, first of all, if you look into the decarbonization process, this is the OECD average. And this is Denmark, Germany, Sweden. You see that you have, first of all, in the OECD as such, a tremendous uh, reduction in carbon intensity over time. We have looked over 40 years for there is a long cycle you have to look into. But you also see that these, all these three economies have been outperforming. Have they been less competitive? No. They are three of the most competitive economies in Europe, I would say, today. So here you see the, the GDP. You see the reduction in emissions. And you see the uh, uh, energy. Yeah, the energy intensity. So you see that they have all been able to, in part in absolute terms, partly in, in relative terms, decouple from growing in energy and carbon intensity. There are much more to say about this, but this is just a, just a little bit to prove the case that there, from what I can see, you cannot even prove that there is a conflict if you are able, and all those three countries, I would say, have a rich history in energy policy. You're really rich, you know that from Denmark, and I know it from Sweden, and I know it's the same in, in, in Germany. What is interesting is, also when you look into those economies, is that you, it didn't start 1970 as a decolonization method. It started as, as a competitive or insecurity of supply issue. And then you can see that the three different Objectives have been fluctuating difference over time. But it has led in the same direction. And that is, I think, what we will see on the European level also. That you cannot pick out decarbonization and sustainability. You have to relate it to, to security of supply and to competitiveness. And in principle, I would say that the, it's at least not a conflict. So let me that end by going back to this 2050 study that we did, we, we tried to, to uh, look into uh, the full cost for energy in 2020, 2030, 2050. And here you see, see um, uh, where, what will oh, the figures have disappeared. When I sent it, it disappeared. I have to go back to my slide. So what you see here is the baseline cases, and here you see a decarbonized pathway. There you see that, uh, that the cost will be down 9, here it will be down eight, close to 18, and here minus 25%. And you also see that this is, is power. You, you, you see that power will be up enormously as a part of the total and as a part of the total cost. So, I just have to sort out my papers here. So, I, once again, I would say that going for more a more sustainable economy, for a more sustainable power system, for more renewables, is definitely not a, a cost issue as such. On the, on the, on the other hand, I can would say that you can prove that you can lower the cost over time. But the crucial thing is that the cost mix will be very, very different. So just to, to finalize, I would say that we know that the tools laid at our feet. We know what to do. And in the very end, it's up to us, to our ability to implement the solution, but also our ability to cooperate, because it's very clear that you need to cooperate uh, over borders, you need to cooperate in regions, but you also need cooperation on the European level. For it's very, very hard for a single country to implement that on their own. If you want to find out more about the studies we, are doing, we have been doing, you have the whole page here. Thanks.
Thank mm-hmm. you.